It's a pleasure to be here. It's a hard act to follow, I have to say, Sven, uh, Sven and Cleve. Uh, but I'll try to do something here. I won't be quite as entertaining, I don't think. I'm going to talk about a package that follows in Jim's uh, footprints in many ways. Slate is an activity that we have to be the next generation of linear algebra software dedicated to uh, tar or targeting uh, exascale computing. Um, I'm at the University of Tennessee, which is located in Knoxville. has a great uh, heritage, householder and Pete Stewart, we're also, also there. Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, where Householder and uh, Pete and Givens uh, worked. And I also have a position here in this department with uh, Nick and Fran and others uh, here at the University of Manchester, although I only spend about one month a uh, year here. Um, 20, uh, 35 years ago, we had another meeting for Jim that was held at Argonne. So it was his 65th uh, birthday party. And this meeting was at Argonne National Laboratory. It says in honor of Jim's 65th. It was organized by Gene, uh, Gene Golub, uh, George Moray, Danny uh, Sorensen, and myself. And we had a number of uh, very distinguished speakers, none of which are here, as it turns out. <laughs> so uh, uh, Jim Cody, Carl DeBoer, Bill Gear, uh, Peter Hoover, uh, Herb Keller, Peter Lax, uh, uh, Beresford, uh, Mike Powell, uh, Pete Stewart, and Jim himself. And uh, uh, Alan Hoffman was the ringleader or the toastmaster that evening. And um, sadly, I guess many of those people are no longer uh, with us. Uh, but that was a fun meeting celebrating his, um, his 65th uh, birthday party. Um, Jim had a tremendous impact on my career. Um, I started at Argonne back in 1972 and uh, as an undergraduate and uh, was working uh, Jim Poole, uh, who was the director of the Applied Math Division at Argonne, hired me and he said go work with Brian Smith who was developing this software package called IcePack. And um, during the summers, uh, Jim Wilkinson would show up at Argonne. Jim came into my office and said there's this guy coming and you should um, uh, go talk to him. And if he has any programming needs, you should work with him. Now I didn't know Jim Wilkinson. Uh, I didn't know of his importance in the field. and I went in there as, uh, without having any hesitation, chatted with him a bit and uh, said, you know, if you have any needs, I'd be happy to program it up. I've never uh, experienced Jim programming, so I, I don't have any recollection of him actually writing a line of code. Now, he, I'm sure in his younger days he did. But when he, when he was at Argonne, he, he would ask me to occasionally code something up, and I uh, took it very seriously. I went away that day and spent the, the better part of the day and night implementing it and the next morning went to his office and showed him the results and uh, he gave me another assignment which I went away and, and did, and did uh, again until I got uh, too tired and realized this was going to go on for a while. So um, the summer was a great time at Argonne. There were many um, uh, communal activities and uh, conferences. Uh, this sequence of pictures here uh, were from Argonne. Uh, I took these pictures as it turns out except for uh, two of them. Um, I always think Jim is giving Cleve the finger in this, in, this particular, uh, in this particular picture here. And there's a lot of interesting characters in that picture, Lloyd Fosdick, and uh, 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 I, I can't go through the whole list. Um, and some are from the Oxford uh, Gatlinburg meeting. Uh, this was taken at my house. Um, this is uh, Heather and Jim, uh, George Murray, uh, David Young. Uh, this is Doris, at that time called Payas, and her uh, her previous husband, Lee Payas, who passed away. Uh, this is uh, my wife, uh, my son is somewhere in there, and uh, that's a younger version of me. And uh, these parties were, this was very typical of a party with Jim. There would be many bottles on the table. He was reputed to have a wooden leg and could um, uh, drink quite a bit the night and uh, be very uh, fresh in the morning, give a very elegant uh, lecture. It was amazing to see that, and I perhaps have carried some of that over perhaps too much. Um, but he was very, uh, very uh, stimulating. Uh, uh, it was already mentioned about these lectures. There are four lectures, and they're really quite uh, fascinating, that were taken at Argonne. I think a few of us were in the audience. Cleve was probably in the audience for these. Uh, I don't know if Jim, Jim Bunch, you may have been in the audience as well for, the, uh, for these. But there was a wonderful sequence. The case for using them has become quite strong. And I was going to say something about that in a later lecture this week under the title of Gibbons Revisited. I think when this idea was first suggested, and I think Gentleman was probably the first person to talk about it, 
Um, he didn't present it in a very general way, and I think... So about modified givens. People did uh, uh, tend to underestimate the effect that it was likely to have. Uh, since, uh, since then, I think his presentation has been improved and generalized a bit, and it's uh, particularly by a young man called Hamerling. <laughs> and I should say that, something about that in the Gibbons Revisited lecture. Um, and with <laughs> Hamerling's way of looking at it and presenting it, it's quite possible that we would, if we were starting all over again, go back essentially uh, to the Gibbons <laughs> method for dealing with real symmetric okay, matrix. That, that was my point, is to, to get Sven's, uh, Sven's thing there. So Jim introduced me to Sven. I, one of my first trips to the UK, um, uh, I, um, I was working at Argonne, I came to the UK, visited NAG, and uh, also uh, uh, Jim invited me to go to NPL. And I, uh, I remember being there and uh, Sven, he introduced me to Sven during that uh, early, early visit, and we've had a long friendship uh, ever since. Um, this slide here uh, reflects uh, uh, pretty much my life uh, on the numerical side, um, uh, starting with uh, ice pack um, uh, uh, for eigenvalues, of course, lin pack for linear systems of equations and the SVD algorithm, uh, LA pack in the 90s, looking at taking those two packages and sort of modernizing them for the architectures of the time, looking at block based uh, algorithms that would effectively work on the cache based systems that we have working on scale pack that took um, the ideas there and used distributed memory to work on uh, the, the, the uh, architectures that were of, uh, of use in the last century. You gotta remember that was quite a long time ago when those packages were, were designed. Those packages have a lot of use today. Um, we have some experimental packages, I'll call them, uh, which tried to um, capture uh, some of the current ideas and put them into software and make them usable by the community. So Plasma looks at multi-core specifically, using multi-core improving on the ideas of LAPAC. Magma looks at accelerators and trying to use the ideas here with accelerated base computing, think GPUs. And then LAFET is a project that we have that just ended um, based um, uh, with colleagues in Sweden and uh, at Rutherford and also in uh, INRIA. Uh, working on various components of uh, linear algebra, uh, but our, our part was dealing with, again, the dense, uh, the dense chapter. It turns out that, in general, these packages won't, won't work well today on, on our modern uh, high-performance machines. So we're looking at exascale computing. 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second is where we're targeting software. And these packages just don't uh, cut it, and I'll try to explain why in a moment. Um, the Department of Energy is the one promoting high-performance computing. They use these high-performance systems to do science today. So simulation is driving a lot of the uh, work that goes on within the Department of Energy. High-performance computing is a big thing. This project, called the Exascale Computing Project, is the biggest game in town. So it's a project that will spend $3.6 billion over the next four years. And that's a project which is full steam ahead. It has no signs of being uh, interrupted. Half of that money is going to be spent on hardware. So half of that money, $1.8 billion, just on hardware. On three machines, in fact. And the rest of the money is going to be spent on applications, software, algorithms, and, and, and the like. Applications are the big thing. There are 23 applications that are being targeted here. And... Um, DOE is providing the funding. So the Department of Energy has two parts. It has what's called open science. That's the part that Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab does. It does open science. Its publications are out there. All the software is freely available. And then there are three labs that are run under the NNSA, the National Nuclear Strategic A. And uh, that's, uh, that's Los Alamos, Andea, and Livermore. And they do defense, think of it defense-related work, weapons, weapons work. So that's more classified work. So that's where the, that's where the money is going to be spent at those six labs and a few universities. So I got tapped on the shoulder and asked to help, help in providing the linear algebra library. So I'm part of this project, part of this effort, uh, going to benefit from some of that. Uh, this is a project. It's not a research project. So we're not expected to do research. With all the other projects I've worked on, we did a research project. And as a byproduct, we produce software. So the software that was produced has always been an add-on, as, 
as an adjunct to the research itself. It turned out to be useful software. It turns out it had a life, but it never had the support. It never had the ability to sustain itself into the future. And software needs to be sustained. We never wrote the papers about the re research. We never wrote the paper. We wrote the software in the end. <laughs> That's right. So we uh, lied, cheated, and steal is the way I look at it and developed the software uh, from the research uh, funding. Um, so this is, a, this is a picture of uh, the machines that have been in the DOE complex. Today, we're here in, in uh, 2018. There are two big machines, number one and two on the top 500 list. The machine at Oak Ridge National Laboratory is called Summit. It has uh, IBM and NVIDIA-based machine, IBM commodity processors together with GPUs from NVIDIA. There's a machine at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory based on IBM and, and uh, NVIDIA as well. Same kind of general architecture. There's going to be two machines which are lower class machines which are going to provide support for DOE before we get to the big time. So in 2021 is when we're expected to have Exascale. 1.8 billion just for the hardware. So that's the race car, if you will. And then 1.8 billion to have all the application software and other things on top of that. So the first machine is going to go into Argon. That will be based on IBM and Cray. But Cray was purchased recently by HPE. Um, so uh, uh, HPE and, and, and Intel will be the uh, providers of that. And that will be about an exaflop peak performance. We're going to get a machine called Frontier. It's AMD based. So AMD processors and AMD GPUs plus an interconnect from Cray or from HPE. And then Livermore's machine has not been announced, but I expect it to be very much like the uh, Oak Ridge machine. We've had a team, uh, we, we've teamed together in the past. So again, one exaflop for Argon, one and a half or greater at, uh, at Oak Ridge, and probably something similar to that uh, at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So here's the number one machine today. These, this is not the machine we're targeting, but it's like the machine. We're going for exascale. So this machine has a peak performance of 200 flops, 200 <laughs> petaflops. Uh, it's 64-bit floating point arithmetic. So just, just to be clear where we're, where we're at in terms of the numbers. It has two IBM processors, 22 cores each. It has six NVIDIA GPUs. That makes up a node, has some memory and some, uh, some interconnect. At 46,000 nodes is where we're at. So 4,600 nodes and 2.4 million cores on this machine. So 2.4 million cores. Now, if you're going to program this machine, nodes are the thing that you really target in terms of, um, in terms of MPI. And then you've got to worry about all the cores in terms of um, uh, open MP on the back end. So that becomes an issue, Mellanox and other things. But that's not the real story or the full story. The full, story of this, the full story of this machine is that it has a peak performance of 3.3 exaflops already. So that's for 16-bit floating-point arithmetic. So this machine has the ability to do 16-bit floating-point arithmetic. So if you can do 16-bit in your computations and get away with it, you can, you can see really great, uh, great performance out of this machine. So there's many, many people looking at this. I think we'll hear a few talks. Uh, Lynn, are you going to be talking about... Aaron, you're going to be talking, yeah, okay. Uh, so <laughs> uh, so uh, machine, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence is a big thing. Each of these nodes have two kinds of processors. Most of the performance comes from the GPU. 97% of the peak performance comes from the GPU. So if your application, your program doesn't use GPUs on this machine, forget about it. You're not going to get any kind of performance out of it. You really have to strive at, at getting that. And again, it has a lot of these NVIDIA GPUs, 27,000 GPUs. Today, the street value of those GPUs has gone up. They're $15,000 a piece. And they've gone up because of machine learning. So machine learning can use these GPUs. So they've driven up the cost. AI has driven up the cost of this. We couldn't afford this machine today if we had to buy it because of the price of those uh, GPUs today. So that's, that's the current state. I mentioned uh, hardware and software and applications. There's a software stack that's being put in place. That software stack has a number of components, programming models, tools, data visualization, and a general ecosystem. But math libraries are important in that uh, ECP software stack. Uh, and the software that's being developed, the math libraries that are being developed are pictured here. The, the, um, the NNSA labs, the uh, the weapons labs have their own 
math libraries that they have to take care of and they're getting funding for that. And then there are a bunch of other things, Petsy, there's Super LU from Berkeley, uh, there's Trolinos from Sandia, there's our stuff called Slate, uh, there's some other projects here as well. So we're working on this thing called Slate, which is really a replacement for, um, um, think of it as a replacement for LAPAC, ScalaPAC, uh, uh, the LINPAC and, and uh, ICEPAC. So this is a project, it's not a research project. So we have deliverables, there's timetables, you have to put things together. There's Alassian, the big system that you have to enter stuff into. It's a, it's a headache and a nightmare at some level but it's a way to fund our software. So really it's about funding software in this context. So we're developing this dense linear algebra, think of it as ice pack and lin pack on steroids. Uh, Slate's gonna provide this uh, fundamental dense linear algebra carrying on, in some sense, the Wilkinson uh, tradition of moving that, I, those ideas into high performance <coughs> computing. So hopefully we can get at high performance uh, from that uh, through these uh, dense matrix things. Again, so I'm, I'm just talking about dense problems, not talking about sparse. Other people are dealing with the sparse, uh, the sparse activities and uh, dealing with them with a fair degree of uh, efficiency. Um, okay, so, so what's wrong with this software? Ice pack, the handbook, uh, the uh, ice pack uh, package and software. Ice pack was derived from the Algol. The Algol organized things by rows. The Fortran was a translation of the Algol, row oriented. That became um, pretty poor in terms of performance. When ice pack was done, there were no blahs. So the blahs had not been created yet. If you take a look at what happens to ice pack on today's, I'll call it a modern processor. So this is done on an Intel Sandy Bridge. It's a little old today. But when you run ice pack, you get a for just, the, for just the singular values now we're talking about, and this is for the singular values and vectors, this is sort of the performance profile we get in terms of gigaflops. So we're below one gigaflop in terms of performance as we increase the size of the problem. This, this upper glitch here is caused because things are cache contained, so we get higher performance for that. As the problem size grows, we're more memory bound and we end up with memory kind of performance. So we're getting at something about 0.8 gigaflops in this case, something about two gigaflops in this case, the peak performance of one core is 22. So we're roughly an order of magnitude lower than the peak performance for this processor here on, a, on, the, on this code. So this is taking the old ice pack code developed in the 70s, putting it on today's processor, it runs fine, gets the right answers, but the performance is terrible. And it really doesn't go to exploit any of these multi-core just by compiling it with you know, turn the optimization up to 11 and see where you get and, and you don't get very far in terms of the optimization. Okay, so Terry, taking that story a little bit further, uh, LINPAC. LINPAC took the algorithms there and re readjusted them in many ways, made them column oriented. This is Fortran code, column orientation, looked at uh, using the blahs. At the time we did this, we only had the level one blahs, very little data reuse. But in terms of speed up, what we see is a speed up of roughly a factor of three over the ice pack routine. So that's a speed up. Speed up the same accuracy, the same basic algorithm, just oriented it a little bit differently using a better optimization. And that's also true for getting the singular, uh, singular vectors as well. So getting a factor here of about two improvement in terms of the performance. This guy here is interesting. He sort of goes up and then he stops here and I haven't continued. Well, this program getting bigger and never, it failed. It never, never finished. And I haven't had the courage to go back and look at why the ice pack SVD didn't finish for that. But there's a bug someplace lurking either in the compiler or in the code. I suspect in the compiler. Um, okay, LA pack was an effort to change the orientation instead of just one column to do a panel at a time looking at panel wise computations. Um, in this particular case, uh, we're looking at, again, speed up over ice pack. So this blue chart here looks at uh, the LA pack code. Uh, this is the LIN pack code. So you see a bump up in performance, at least a factor of uh, two over the, uh, the LIN pack code. And uh, if you use all the cores, you can because of the blahs, level two and level three blahs were introduced in this particular thing here. We get a factor of 30 to 40 improvement over the ice pack code. Again, the same kind of results. The codes are changing. That's the only thing changing. The hardware is exactly the same. Just taking different codes and running them on different hardware, looking at 
how the performance matches, again, the same kind of accuracy that we're seeing there. But again, we're not, we're not getting near the peak performance of this, of this uh, system. So what does the high performance computing environment look like? We have distributed memory, we have MPI and OpenMP to contend with, and we use them both in terms of the programming model. We have heterogeneous uh, set of, uh, of, of uh, uh, config hardware configuration with commodity processors plus GPUs. Simple loop level parallelism doesn't cut it. Fork join kind of parallelism, bulk synchronous processing, you can't do that. I've got millions of cores that I have to take care of hundreds of thousands of processes that are in the air, and I can't do that fork and that join. That would kill the performance for these algorithms. So I have to look at a different way of doing business. Communication is very important. Our, our hardware today is over-provisioned for floating point operations. Data movement is where all of the, uh, is where all of the time uh, goes on, and uh, uh, that uh, has to be taken, uh, uh, taken care of in the algorithm, otherwise we'll be in in trouble. Um, a comparison of operations today really doesn't cut it in terms of the real evaluation of our software. That is, more operations may take less time in terms of the overall thing because of the way the operations are structured. Today we're looking at using 64, 32, and even 16-bit floating point operations in the software itself to try to get ed to take the advantage of the performance that we see of that 16-bit. Just to give you a handle on that, it's about a factor of 10 between using 16-bit effectively and using 64-bit. So it's an order of magnitude improvement if you can get away with the 16-bit floating point operations in your computations today. That's if you're uh, uh, organizing them correctly. Um, okay, the big uh, changes that are taking place to relieve some of the stress of fork join bulk synchronous processing is to go to a more data flow-like orientation for the algorithms. So today our algorithms generate directed acyclic graphs. They basically generate a lot of work, throw it into, the, into, a, into a bucket, and then have a, a system take that work and then execute it, uh, still respecting the dependencies associated with the, with the data. So instead of getting something where this is a cartoon of maybe 16 cores executing, this is based on a loop level kind of parallelism, fork, join, fork, join kind of parallelism where we bring things together and go apart. The white space indicates wasted time. The colors indicate that you're getting something productive. By rearranging things to make it more, um, to avoiding that kind of synchronization, compresses things and you can actually run things much, much faster. So that's the way our, our algorithms are structured today. If you were to take a high level look at them, they would look the same, but they would be, have this under the covers of generating tasks, and then when those tasks dependencies are satisfied, inputs and outputs, then they release and let other things execute. Um, so our, our, our basic structure in terms of uh, changes that have taken place, the LAPAC routines dealt with panels and we looked at organizing things around uh, the structures in terms of those panels and the basic operations were done on them. Today we're looking at tiles and those tiles are much finer grain associated with it so we can generate more work and have the potential for having more things uh, overlap or be done in, in, uh, in, in parallel simultaneously. So if we take a look at what would happen uh, based on a loop level uh, kind of parallelism with the dependencies here and the, uh, the organization, this is looking at a four core implementation, that's the four join level kind of way of doing business. Um, a a DAG based representation of the algorithm uh, would uh, be able to compress this somewhat. Uh, this is just looking at four cores, so we end up with a, with a graph which is actually a little bit shorter, which meaning the execution time uh, would be reduced in terms of that. We're interested in standards, of course. One of the standards that we've uh, implemented in the NLA FET project and has been adopted by the community is this idea of batching operations. So batching the BLAS operations, not doing one matrix multiply, but doing a whole sequence of matrix multiplies. That occurs a lot in machine learning. Uh, it occurs a lot, in, a lot in the algorithms that we use. Think about doing a surest complement. Uh, we generate a whole sequence of these batched operations. But we're going beyond just doing the blahs. We're also looking at uh, the, uh, the factorizations in terms of these batched operations. We see that occurring more often as well, that there's a need for 
batching a bunch of operations, think of a bunch of SVDs simultaneously. So we have a routine which does that. And basically what it does is instead of doing one at a time, where the processor is very powerful and it, it, would, it would basically be wasting its, it would have a lot of idle cycles in just doing one of them, uh, we think about uh, batching those things, doing a bunch of them simultaneously, having a manager behind the scene which can effectively be dealing with the, that whole batch of them and doing it uh, under the covers and getting much more efficiency. And that leads to, in certain cases, a factor of 30 uh, speed up over what we would have gotten. This is a particular, in this particular case, we're looking at matrix multiplies. These are around uh, 256, that's the dimension of those matrix multiplies, seeing a 30 time advantage in using this batching over having a loop around each of those uh, BLAS operations. Uh, these DAGs have the other ability of uh, taking and compressing uh, the execution flow. Um, this is doing a uh, convolution, deconvolution, kind of uh, finding the inverse of a symmetric positive definite matrix. Um, and we end up with a situation where the graph, um, there's, there's three DAGs generated. They have a performance characteristic as demonstrated there. We could actually take that DAG and, and push it together so that we end up with a much more compressed uh, version of that. And Nick is telling me I'm running out of time, so let me... Let me zoom to the ending of this. I, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so here are some of the design issues um, that we're dealing with in Slate. There's um, parallelism that has to be dealt with, distributed memory, programming issues, MPI and OpenMP. There's heterogeneous nature. There's uh, dealing with data flow and scheduling concepts. There's overlapping communication and computation. It's one of the things that wasn't done with Scalapack. Communication avoiding is critical. Minimiza minimizing synchronization is the other thing, asynchronous formulation. And uh, the question is, uh, how repeatable should these algorithms be? It's hard to get exactly the same answer today and tomorrow on the same problem on a parallel machine. So do you need bitwise reproducibility? That's a question. I can do it, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you in terms of performance, because now I have to maybe sequentialize or be able to repeat something. But if that can be relaxed, then I can do a little bit better. Uh, good numerics are there. We're looking at mixed precision. We're looking at algorithms which are responsibly reckless. So they take a reckless course to get a solution. They check to see if they've got the solution. And if they don't, they back up and do something else. We do that today with iterative refinement for systems of equations. Um, so we're looking at a C++ framework for all of this. There'll be a Fortran binding. There'll be an interface to the old stuff. And, you know, performance is the other thing, which is... Uh, complicated today. So you want to minimize, do you want to minimize the operations, the time to solution, or the energy consumed? Those are all things that have to be put into the bucket and, uh, and, and thought about in this context. So with that, let me say thanks um, to all the people who have contributed to the software over the past uh, 40 plus years. There's a lot of people to be thanked. I'm not sure I got all of them on this graph. Uh, but really, Jim is the guy that uh, started this off. We're trying to keep uh, that spirit that he had and the, um, the same level and effort and integrity in the software and in the solutions uh, as we go forward to uh, exascale-based computing. And with that, I'll uh, stop and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hey, thanks very much, Jack. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. So that was just an example of, of doing this. So it's a, um, it's, uh, some people claim they need, to exp the, they need to have the elements of that inverse for, for uh, in, uh, doing uh, covariance variance matrix. So they, 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 that was just an example of how to do it. I would not advocate doing the inverse explicitly, of course, as my advisor's in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? We're going to argue. I want to take the other There you go. That's right. <laughs> Yes, Margaret. So the Department of Energy, since I've known about it, which is a while, has always wanted faster computers to solve harder problems. Is that continuing? I mean, they're solving a lot of p difficult problems now. Are they moving into new areas? I know you can't give any details, but Secrets. I mean, they do no. fusion, <laughs> they do, sim you know. So, so there's a list of 23 applications that they're, they're trying right. to do. Uh, those are the main focus pushing forward. Uh, they want to solve uh, bigger problems, greater fidelity, uh, more resolution, faster, uh, faster, bigger. But something cheaper. new. 
I mean, so, fast or bigger, those all are huge, So, So right? di different areas, yeah. So different okay. areas uh, certainly are, are there. Uh, machine learning has to be there. So there, there are projects that deal with that. So, you know, there's a big brain projects, uh, you know, the, 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 the moonshot project that uh, Rick Stevens is, is dealing is one of, the, one of the efforts and that has uh, targeted exascale as being the, uh, one of their things. So DOE has um, the same set of problems, wanting to do them to greater fidelity and uh, bigger, faster, but then also some other problems which are claimed new problems that they have to solve that they want to solve. There's one back there, yes. Right over there. Just, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, maybe that's not a very objective impression, but there seems to be a divergence between like these exascale needs getting more and more difficult to program and to maintain the libraries are, get, libraries are getting more complicated, um, while at the same time, a lot of people do computing on desktop machines. I'm thinking of like small engineering uh, offices, for example. Um, where do you see this development is going? Because if now most of effort is devoted to programming for exascale machines, um, will desktop computing be left behind in the long run? Or? Um, uh, so uh, so you're, you're pointing out this pyramid of, of users, where yes. at the top are the high priests that get to use the big, uh, big honking machines, yeah. and then the rest of us are sitting there using our laptops, yeah. which are quite powerful today, by the way, right? So you know, we have laptops which are, you know, my laptop here runs giga hundreds of gigaflops worth of computing, and, and I'm, I feel quite satisfied when I do something on it. Um, uh, so, uh, are people going to be left in the dust? There's always a trickle-down effect, is the way I look at it. So, the algorithms that are being designed that are new, those ideas trickle down. And, you know, there are examples of Divine Conquer is, a, is the one that comes to mind. You know, that was developed, it's, it's very useful in this context, but it trickles down to getting good, reasonable, better performance even on, on our standard things. So, there's a lot of things which will benefit uh, even our laptop computers, even things that go into MATLAB. Um, uh, from, from the exascale world, uh, but there is nothing at the exascale point, and it is complicated, but, you know, at some level, it's no more complicated than we faced this, you know, last century when we did MPI, when we had to do distributed memory. It's the same level of complication where people, you know, they bitched and moaned about going to distributed memory, having to rewrite all of their applications and algorithms to do that. And, um, you know, they did it, and they're, 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 they moved on from that, and, and they're, they're fine. And now they're bitching and moaning about, you know, we've got heterogeneous things to worry about, and how is that all going to fit into our, our picture? And we'll deal with it. We'll overcome that. And our applications will benefit in the end from that. So you mentioned um, modern C++ framework, but also everything that you said just now about heterogeneous and distributed computing. Um, so modern C++ still doesn't support anything outside of its sort of <laughs> the memory space of the program that's running. So is there a case to be made for having something in C++ or lobbying the C++ standards committee to sort of include more distributed and heterogeneous? Um, uh, so we would like to do that, uh, but you know we're going to use a framework of MPI to get the distributed nature. Uh, C++ allows us greater flexibility in terms of the software engineering aspects of the of the code, allowing us to develop things. Uh, templates is the easiest thing that comes to mind, uh, where we can we can easily uh, implement something and have it rather than to rewrite things or the way we've done it in the past of having a, a tool uh, be there to help with the generation of the code. It's just done in native in the language itself, and uh, you know there's this uh, adage that um, it, it's inefficient in C++. Well, you know that may have been true last century, but today it's not true. And the software that we're generating is just as efficient as what you might do in C or, or Fortran in the C++ world. So I don't, I don't buy that aspect uh, that some people might criticize this, uh, this at. But everything is parallel. We have to embrace that. It's, uh, MPI is the, is the mechanism that's used under the covers. Message passing is going to be going on. And uh, OpenMP is going to be used on the node itself. Please? You, you forget about it. Okay. No, he he's, he waves it off. He didn't want to. He didn't want to. So I think in that case, we will thank you.